Okay, so I'm going to start off. Um, I'm going to start off with this image right here. Okay, you don't have to um, shout out answers, but just wondering, does anybody know or have an idea what this image is? No. Yeah? My sister. Right? Oh, I said you don't need to. <laughs> the world, the universe, 
is from God with his word. You know? It didn't come out of a cellular organism. That's why I was reading before, because a lot of evolutionists, like scientists, they try to make themselves sound so smart. So in, in university, I was reading this book. It's called The Selfish Gene Theory, right, by Richard Dawkins. And it was a it was a waste of time for me, but I just had to do it because it was school. Like I had to read it. But his definition of how the world was created was because of single like organism that through series of chemical reaction, this and that, and the stability of that um, the the cell keeps replicating, replicating, and it, apparently it created the mountains, it created the the ocean, it created us. And I'm like, that is the definition of lack of faith, right? They try to like outsmart God. They try to make them feel so smart. Why? I don't know. I guess they just want to be recognized. Right? But no, that is not what faith is. Faith is believing in something even though there's no physical proof. Right? Believing in our God. Conviction of things not seen. The second part, assurance of, of things hoped for. Right? When you have faith in someone, when you use the word faith, usually it involves confidence. Putting your confidence putting your trust in someone, right? And later on, I'm going to um, elaborate more on this part, this second part of definition as we go on to the teaching. So just stay tuned with that. What does my question? Oh, yes. Why do we have faith? That is the question. Now, we, we know what faith is now. We know, okay, you believe in something that you don't see. In this case, we believe in our God who is awesome, right? Who created everything. That we go to, like, different places. We go to the beaches. We, go, we want to go to Arizona because we see like all this, that creation that was not man-made, right? It's all natural. Why? Because God is good. He created all those things. And the reason why we have faith, it says right here, is because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Do you agree with that? Amen. It is impossible to please God without faith. Let's read it. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him in Hebrews 11.6. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. It's written right there. Like a lot of the stuff that uh, I'm saying right now, literally, I got it from the Bible. Like word for word, what I'm gonna say is from here. I'm not even gonna make it up. But like so, without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? And God was really testing my faith today or last night because okay so as i was preparing this teaching i was writing like a note like a written script for me so that it's easier like the flow would be easier but as i was writing the note the at this laptop cr like crashed like it erased everything i spent hours and hours and i'm like i was crying i, I was really like devastated i'm like lord why why right but it is a form of faith. He's probably telling me, you don't need like to say it. What is going to come out of your mouth is me talking to you. You don't need to prepare. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like in your heart, like God will be the one who will work in you. So, yes, it is impossible to please God without faith. And who is our God? Many, many scriptures in the Bible just define who our God is. Many examples. Do you know the, you know the story? Of Moses, right? How God used Moses to free the Israelites from the hands of the Pharaoh, the Egyptian, because they were slaves, right? That alone is the power of God, because He listened to His people. And just this, um, surprises, like this verse shows you who God is. I'm going to read it first in Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. It says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious. Our God is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Right? It's not limited. It's a lot. Like, never ending. And faithfulness. Right? He's so faithful to us. Oh, he is so faithful to us. Because as I was reading God's word, I can just tell how dumb we are as humans. Do you guys know that? We're stupid. That's the that reason why like, God chose, uh, or Jesus chose shepherd, sheep, as an illustration. The sheep are stupid, like, really 
are dumb, you know? <laughs> we are dumb, and without his guidance, without his wisdom, we often make mistakes yeah. like, we don't even know about it, but I will tell you more about it later, um, as I will go on. So let's go back to God, our God. Who is our God? He is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and thousands of generations. And see, God is not only this, but He is also just. Right? If you keep reading, it says, um, forgiving, iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the fathers, on the children and the children's children. So basically, God is God is good, at the same time, God is just. Right? And in here, it says here, the Lord the Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. He is our refuge. We can just go to Him when we need help. Right? In Lesson 2 Samuel 22. In Psalms 73 26, David said, My friend, my flesh. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Right? God is our strength. Um, gracious is the Lord and righteous. God is merciful. Again! Right? And it just keeps repeating. He is merciful. He is righteous. He is perfect. And last but not least, there's more. There's more. But one of the, um, the scripture here in Deuteronomy 10 17 it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods. Okay? And Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no credit. This is true. And I'll show you why. <laughs> well, God will show you why. Right? He is our God, who is the only God. He is the God of gods and Lord of lords. And as I was reading 1 Samuel chapter, or the whole the book of 1 Samuel, it just kind of translates this, literally this verse, right? So to tell you, I'm going to go back and tell you a story um, and just show you how God is so good, powerful, and no one is, is like him, right? Um, in 1 Samuel, so the Israelites and the Philistines, this is story time now. Philistines, they're at war, okay, at this time. And I told you, we're stupid, right? We're, we're not smart as, as human beings. So at that time, the war, um, uh, the Israelites were losing, right? They were losing. So, and, and there, were, there was an Ark of God. You know, Ark of God is filled with uh, God's presence, right? Ark of God, or, uh, God Ark of the Covenant. And they decided, okay, we're losing. The Philistines are going to win. I know what to do. I'm going to bring the Ark of God and bring it to the place of war, right? But, like, that's not going to do anything. First of all, God wants communication. God wants you to ask Him, not just, like, do it your own will. At that point, the Israelites were doing it at their will and, and thought, like, okay, because God's presence in that thing, the Ark of God, that I will just put it there so that we will win. But no, they ended up losing. The Philistines won, right? And as a result, they took the Ark of God. This is First Samuel chapter five. If you guys are looking at it, if you want to check it, I'm not. <laughs> but like, um, so they took the Ark of God, right? They took it. They're like, oh, probably, oh, victory! I'm gonna loot this. I'm gonna take this because I, I conquered. Like we won against the Israelites, right? And when they took this Ark of God, the Ark of God. They placed it in the, place, the city in Ashdod, where they have the temple, Dagon. Dagon is their god. I'm just telling you the ball about this, because it's funny, we, Pastor Pat Francis also talked about Dagon. And I'm like, I'm going to talk about that. Why are you using that? But, um, like, so, anyways, he, this is their god. Dagon. He looks like a mermaid. Merman. <laughs> like, how do you, like, even worship this thing, right? Like, how? This is their God. So they place it beside their God, right? And so the next day, I guess, when they place it, I guess it's in a way of like equating gods, because they're like, oh, the Israelites serve this God. We should put it beside our God, because, I don't know, maybe they can be friends, or whatever, right? And they put it beside each other. <laughs> and the next day, literally, they saw this idol, it's a statue. This idol falls flat in front of the Ark of God. On the feet. All flat. All flat. On his face. <laughs> on his face, right? Not sideways, not backwards, not on the other side, but flat on his face. So they're like, the, the, the Philistines came back and they're like, what just happened? We put it back out because it's our God. We have to put it back so we can keep 
the holiness in him. And the next day, guess what happened? I fell again. Not only fall, but his head and his head cut off like this. Da, 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 like that. <laughs> see you guys. See you guys. He, he, right? God is so powerful. So God is probably just letting them know in your face. There's no other God than me. I'm the only God. Look at this. Yeah. Right? He is the God of God and the Lord of Lord. I know. It's amazing. When I read this, I'm like, whoa, this existed? This was in the Bible? How did I not know this? Right? And that's no coincidence how the head and the hands are cut off. No coincidence. Because the head, that's where wisdom lies. The head, that's where your action lies. So it's saying, God's essentially saying, you have no wisdom, you, have, you can't defend me, right? You, you don't have the power, the strength to defend me and your people, the Philistines, right? God is our only God who is powerful. He is the God of gods, whoever, whatever it might be, the Lord of Lords. That just, I don't know. When I read this, I'm like, whoa, you are here. You're powerful, like, yes, yes. what can you do? It's not even alive. Like, how can a statue, because the statue can break, like, everywhere to pieces, right? Because it fell. But literally, it broke, cut off the head and the head. So that is our God. Amen. He's good. He's powerful. He's our only God. And that's why we have faith in him, right? Put our feet. Look, look what he can do. Just an example. That's one of the many. That's not even it, right? And the other reason... Like we know this is because of his love. His unconditional love that no one ever can ever display here on earth. You might say, okay, my mom is so loving. No, right? God is perfect. Your mom is not perfect. We are flesh. We are sinful, right? Every day you sin, right? So we can't compare the love that God has for us and that we uh, offer to people or we give to people. But God showed his love, his unconditional love through through his son, right? Jesus, through sending his son, through giving us his only son so that we will be saved from our sins. Again, in, in, we know this by heart, but do we really understand it? In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. This is the assurance of faith. This is the assurance of things hoped for that the first definition was talking about. Right? Jesus, he's the founder and perfecter of our faith because of what he did Excuse me, on the cross, right? And people might ask, like, if you love, like, your son, why would you do that to him, right? Well, God said because he loved us too, right? But, like, the main question is, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why did it have to be like that? The reason is, because prior to Jesus, when Jesus came, there's burnt offerings that we give. You know, have you heard about that? The burnt offerings. And prior to Jesus, there is an annual thing that you go, they prepare a tent, right? A tent is right here. Oh, never mind. This is the assurance of faith that I was talking about. Okay, let's read it together. We have Hebrews 10, 22, 23. Let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith, Jesus, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. And that is Jesus. He is the founder. He is our the full assurance of our faith. So as I was going back, um, the reason why, oh, another one. I keep forgetting. So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. You've heard that before, right? Like Jesus, that, that's what they call the beautiful exchange. You know, he who is so holy, he never sinned ever in his life, took our sins so that his righteousness be imparted to us. You know? And that's how God is so good. Like, his love is just overflowing. And as I was saying earlier, the reason why Jesus had to die is because before, there, before we um, we give burnt offerings, it's an annual thing. Um, I will let God speak as I read 
uh, chapter 9 of Hebrews, it says, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship. Okay? This is Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 1. And an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence was there. So, here, the, the, there's two sections of this tent. So the first one, that is called the holy place, okay? And I know, I love it because that's their uh, thing to talk about this too, but like that's um, the holy place where the priests can go in. They can do their rituals, like there's the lampstand, you can see that that's like the Hanukkah that the Jews use, I think it's the same thing. And then there's a bread and thing. And then behind it, there's, so that's the first curtain. The second curtain is called, behind it, it's called the most holy place or the holy of holies. Right there, zoom in. <laughs> right there, you see? Like that is behind that end. And guys, no one can enter that place. Literally, the only the high priest at that time, this was before Jesus came, right? Only high priest came at that time, and that's where they give burnt offerings, you know? Ritual every single year. And that burnt offerings is for our sins, or for the people of Israel at that time. So the, the high, holy high priest would come in to represent other people, right? And bring the offering to God. And the thing is, humans are not perfect. Not everyone can make it there, right? God's presence is so immense that even in the Old Testament, um, Uzzah, we talked about this, Uzzah, Uzzah um, the Ark of God, Jacob, when he touched the Ark of God, he died, right? So like, his presence is so big that no one can just enter there. You have to be holy. You have to be righteous. You have to be sinless. But like, the like humans are not sinless. So in essence, before Jesus, people were putting their hope in the high priest, like flesh, right? And not everyone can make it. Like, um, there are people times when they would just die when they enter the presence, right? Like Pastor Alex was saying that they tie themselves to the rope and the bell so that when they hear the bell ring, it, they pull them out because that means they die, right? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, God didn't want that for us. He wanted a direct access. He didn't want us to, like, wait on someone, like, or depend our hope on a high priest that is not perfect. And that's where Jesus comes, right? Jesus steps in. And that's where, why God sent his only son, his only son Jesus, because he is the only one who can enter in as our high priest. He is holy. He is perfect. He is righteous. And he is the only one fit enough to go in. And that's why he died on the cross, right? Before they would... Okay, before they would present burnt offerings of the blood, blood of, yeah, any sacrificial animals, goats, ram, cows, anything you name it. But God said, he never really, like, took pleasure in it. Do you guys believe me? Like, it was just part of the law. Like, in order to be cleansed, to be cleansed um, for sins, before it was the law, that you have to prepare a burnt offering before God in the, in the most holy place. So, there are quick scriptures here in Hebrews 10, 5 to 10, it says, the highlighted, it says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. God really did not care for them, but because the law required it for us, for the people back then to be cleansed, covered with their sin, they had to do it. Um, offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure, it says. And here, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices, and offering and burnt offerings and sin offerings. Can you imagine what they had to do before? They had to give burnt offerings, sin offerings, their guilt off. There's a lot of different things, right? And like God probably said, enough is enough, and you're never perfect. You can never do that. I need to make a, a way so that like you don't have to do that and depend on some high priest that will always fail you. Because you can't like depend on that because there are sinners too. And in the Old Testament, it says that too. Not only in the New, but he already mentioned it in the Old. In Psalm 46, uh, David was praising God. David, and this was David speaking, said, In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear, burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Right? It's not that, but because of the law, it was necessary. In 1 Samuel 15 to 22, and Samuel said, Has the Lord, he was speaking to King Saul at this time, and I'll give you a backup story after this. 
Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rats. Mm -hmm. So back, back, going back, just a, a story behind this so you understand it, is that uh, King Saul, he was speaking to King Saul. He was the very first king at that time because the Israelites were seeking. Like they wanted a king. God was not enough for them before. But like, um, at that time, God commanded Saul, King Saul, to fight their enemies and get rid of everything. Literally, the men, the women, the children, all their livestock, everything, like the animals, and yeah, I mentioned everything. So basically everything, get rid of them, right? But the, the King Saul, what he did was he spared the king and the livestock, right? He got rid of everything but those, two, those things. And Samuel got so mad because he disobeyed God, right? And his reasoning at that time was, oh, we can use this livestock for burnt offerings, right? But no, he disobeyed God. See, God is like, once I, like, he wants you to be obedient. He wants a relationship with you better than giving your offering to him. Do you know what I mean? So at this time, like, he was saying, like, no, God doesn't care about this because that was his reasoning, King Saul's reasoning before was to offer, like, the, the animal's thing. But basically, no, God doesn't care about it. And, the re and one, one other thing that why these animals are not good enough is because these animals, the burnt offerings, never really took away our sins. Never took away our sins. So in the, yeah, in the uh, past, he, like, God made it wanted to make a way. It says here in Hebrews 10, 3 to 4, says, in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. So you're actually reminded of us, our sins, because this is an annual thing, right? Yearly thing. And these burnt offerings never took away. It says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So God had to do something. So in essence, these burnt offerings just covered our sins so that we look pure before God. It never really took away. So as, um, in my head, like a graffiti on the wall, right? Example, there's a lot of things and you you don't like how it looks like. So you just want to paint it white. And in essence, it's pure again, but in reality, behind that wall, there's still the graffiti. It's still there. And the same thing before with the burnt offerings. Like it never yeah, it's just a cover up. But God wanted to fix that. Like he didn't like he knew like he wanted a relationship with us and he can't be with you know full of sin like he wants to forgive us and take away and wash away that sin and that's where jesus that's why jesus died on the cross right jesus is the lamb of god in hebrews 9 11 to 12 it said but when christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come right remember he is no he is a high priest the ultimate high priest that we've been made, waiting for before they were just hoping on those on the human the sinners, but God, Jesus is different. He is blameless. It says, um, then through the greater and more perfect tent, where the most holy places, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and cows, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Right? And that's why Jesus had, came here in this, on this earth. Right? That's, that's why God sent his only son. So that we can have our eternal redemption, right? So that our sins will not only be covered up, but it will be washed away. Now, I said about the graffiti and the paint. Imagine, there's like, in this analogy, there's like a written stuff on the wall, like pencil writings. Magic goes to magic erasers, you know, the Mr. Clean. And then you just, when you wash it, like, clean it like that, it just, like, it goes away, right? That's like Jesus. But a hundred times better, a million times better, a jillion times better. Like, he took away our sins, right? In Hebrews 10, 11, 13, it says, Every priest stands daily at his birth service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, right? They had to do that. This was before Jesus. They had to keep doing that. Because if it was perfect already before, then Jesus didn't need to come. But no, right? It says, But where Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made faithful for his children. Yes. Amen. Jesus is the assurance of our faith. He is the founder, perfecter of our faith, that through him we are saved, right? That our sins 
are washed away, and earlier the burnt offerings, we said that our sins are only covered. Right? For this one, for Jesus, it's different. As I said it already. He took it away. Oh, single offering is perfected all the time. Yep. And then, um, <clears throat> oh, yes, he took it away. The difference, main difference between Jesus as our the offering, how he died on the cross and the animals, that God said, remember, their sins and their lawless sins no more. It's completely erased. Right? Like, we are brand new people. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of our sins. And that's why we don't need to present any more burnt offerings. We don't need to go through that and hope for like a high priest that, you know, like here in flesh. God made a way. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross as the ultimate Lamb of God, to, like a sacrifice, right? So that we, our sins will be taken away, that our, our, our sins will be forgiven forever, you know? Yeah. Let's see. Jesus. And that's why, let's just go back to that first again. Putting Jesus as assurance of our faith in Hebrews 10, 22-23. Let us draw to you with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and a being. Our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without flavor or who is promised to face Right? Our faith lies not anything else but Jesus, right? He is the perfecter, the founder of our faith, that did just one sacrifice, literally that when he presented himself and, or when God said his son, like when he died on the cross, that one sacrificial love, that one, is was enough. Like, he broke the chain of, like, giving birth offerings. When I was, um, like, learning this, I don't know, I, I guess it just kind of opened my eyes because I only knew who, I, I knew who Jesus was, like, I knew, he died on the cross, but why, right? I didn't know this stuff how, like, before we had to depend on someone for, like, burnt offerings, right? But the, that is the main reason why Jesus came here on earth, because God loves us, and he, he didn't want to, he, he wanted a direct access to him, right? He, so that now, there is no more, that failed, earlier, behind, like that separated the most holy place and the holy place is torn apart. That means we can have a direct access to him. No more need of high priest of the, those people. But like, yeah, like yeah, that's just awesome. I don't know, that really is awesome. And I just I want to continue here that with knowing this faith, like putting our faith in Jesus, we should keep like, you know, running, running the race. Run with endurance. In 1 Timothy 6, I love this. It says, fight the good fight of faith. <clears throat> In Romans, oh, 1 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 11. But as for you, O men of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Because God knows that here in this earth, we're surrounded with a lot of things that can tempt, tempt us to stray, stray away from him. Right? He wants to hold on because Jesus is the assurance of faith, right? He he because of the promises that he holds. He said that if you believe in Jesus, we will have eternal life in him. Right? In heaven. So like here a lot of the pain that we have is temporary. It says in Hebrews, Hebrews um chapter 12, verse 11, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. It is a hard life. Being Christian is not easy, right? A lot of stuff will be against you. But God said, later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And that's the promise, right? And it seems to be hard right now, but because of God's promise to us, like we will chase that. Like, you know, that should be our um, encouragement, our, like, what keeps us going because of Jesus. Jesus, 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 right? Because of Him, His promise, like, we will... Be with him there where there's no pain, no, no, no sickness, right? But yeah, no tears, but have like eternal, eternal joy, eternal everything. It'll be really amazing. I actually can't wait. And yeah, <laughs> so in, in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, this is the thing. This, I love the, the, 
Janice is very earlier too. It's not only for ourselves, it's for everyone, right? Okay? It's faith. We have to work together. It says in the Bible, Hebrews 10, 24, 25, let us consider how to steer up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, which people often do. They might say like, oh, but you know, I already know God, but no, God wants us to meet together, to encourage, not because you, you don't know him, right, that you, you have to go there so that you can know more. Part of the reason is that, but like, he wants us to encourage one another, to use one another, so that we can keep running the race together, together, right? Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, he said it there too, but in encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Because who's coming back? Jesus is coming back. So we have to keep fighting the good fight of faith, right? We have to, like, really focus our attention, focus our eyes in Him. Like, even though there's a lot of struggles or a lot of um, tribulations that comes our way, but you need to really press into God because it eventually <clears throat> He will be coming back, right? And we will be rewarded, right? That's awesome. That is a good, good promise that. I would love to see one day. I don't know when, Jesus, when you're coming back, but we can't wait. So we have to really press into Him and have faith in our Jesus, in the only Son, the one, the Son of God, the only one. But yeah, I think that. Oh, that's everything. Yeah.